So hello everyone, uh, I'm Chris Pate and uh, I work here at LA Louvre as a chief preparator and sometime curator, uh, principal curator of the Rogue Wave program uh, that was initiated in 2001. Um, Peter Goulds, the uh, owner director of the gallery approached me, I was curating shows in the 90s and kind of underground spaces around town and he liked what I was doing and came up with the idea of, he proposed to me, why don't we do something like that here at LA Louvre? And I was kind of shocked at first, but thought it sounded great, um, like a real challenge and something exciting, to, you know, uh, an exciting challenge. And so we did our first um, Rogue Wave in 2001, and it was a good success. It brought, you know, different type of energy into the gallery, and it was uh, really well received. And it led into to, uh, another show in 2005, uh, 2007, and then we took a four, another four-year break. Did one in 2009, at which point we, after like encapsulating those two shows and uh, two catalogs we published, we started to kind of wonder, is this type of show really necessary as much anymore? You know, the, there's California Biennial, or the, the Orange County Biennial, and then the Hammer started to do a biennial, and it was kind of a question of maybe the work is being done uh, already in other places, do we really need to do this anymore? But people would, you know, tend to come to us and wonder, when, when's the next rogue wave? When's the next rogue wave? To the point where we decided it's just got to happen. And so this, the research for this started last fall, and we started, we ended up uh, considering the work of about 130 artists and pared it down to about 30 studio visits, 35 more or less, and uh, to the 15 artists that are in the show that uh, you're, you see before you today. Um, tonight, we have the uh, uh, privilege of three of the artists who we're um, showing who are going to talk about their work. Uh, Kim Schoenstatt, whose piece is behind us here, and also um, the mural outside. Uh, Owen Kidd, uh, who has his three pieces in the back there. And then um, Shereen Gurgis, who's upstairs with the sculpture in our Skyrim space in a large, large scale work you'll see upstairs. But we thought we'd uh, start with Kim downstairs to speak about her work, both uh, indoors and out. First, I want to invite everybody to take one of these. They're on the desk. Because um, what it has in it is source material. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and it's kind of a helpful thing. So I'm going to I'm going to start with this piece since we're all inside and it's warm. Um, when I was first approached to do the project on the exterior and on the interior, I had been for a long time working with LA architecture in opposition to wherever I was showing. So for example, in Prague, I did LA versus Prague in DC, LA versus DC, yada yada. And then I was invited to do a project in my hometown, and I thought, well, there's all this architecture that hasn't been realized. And there's a million projects in LA that happen and then just don't get funded. And so what you're seeing in these pages, in this page here, these are all unrealized works of architecture, um, and they were all proposed for LA. Um, so what, one of my favorites is this one, number seven, and it's the one in the middle, and it's also the one at the very top there. And that is a Rem Cool House proposal for a Venice Canal house. And <laughs> the proposal is really super. He based it on the Hollywood Squares concept of, <laughs> of architecture. And you can really see it. And then the other thing that I did was I, the LA Louvre space I've admired for a long time. It's, I feel it's a really well-scaled space. I really like the way that the windows 
frame views and are subtle but important to the light of the gallery. And I've always liked the Sky Room. I've always liked that it was sort of that raised white cube and it was just sort of there. It was really a, a bold statement. So I asked Fred Fisher for a meeting and he gave it to me. And so, so I sat and I talked with him and he told me about some of the projects that he had proposed and some of his favorite projects that he had proposed. And then I kind of dug around in his archives and I found the uh, one piece you'll see on the very top, it's the sort of V-shaped roof, is his proposal for the LA Zoo Gorilla Husbandry Center. And I really kind of loved that. I loved that this very important architect just put so much thought into a gorilla husbandry center. The other piece of his is down here, and this is another interesting work of architecture where he created an entire house and the center is a void. So that is sort of the opposite of what one normally wants your house to be. You want rooms, you want floors, and he just took it all out. And then in the center, it was just all empty. And I, and I kind of liked that. Um, so the next thing I'll talk about, the rest is, the rest is sort of self-explanatory and very interesting. And you can noodle around in here. Um, but the next thing I'll talk about is what the shapes are interfering with the work. And um, this started back when I did a show in Connecticut at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, and they had in their archives a picture of this old Tony Smith sculpture sitting in the front lawn. And it was so great. And I just, it was such an interruption to that traditional stone architecture. And so that's where this sort of idea began of this interruption. And so having contemporary sculpture interrupting contemporary architecture, both dealing with forms, both dealing with mass, totally different solutions. Um, and these are Solowit incomplete open cubes, which um, were they, I, they might have been shown here. I think they were, yeah. Because uh, they did a uh, Solowit show here. And so that made sense. And what I did, of course, was paint them colors, and then tweaked them and moved them in and out of the work. Um, so then we can, we can mosey outside, and I'll talk for a few minutes about the exterior work. Try to make my life easy. I'm, I'm, you've got the content at this point, so now I'm just going to talk about how the heck did we get it done. Um, thanks to the brilliance of Chris and a lot of problem solving, there was a scissor lift involved, and then what we did was we used vinyl and to make the drawing. And so the vinyl cut went down first, and then we painted all the shapes on, and then we used something uh, very traditional and, and kind of old building technique of a snap line. And a snap line is a, a line that you has filled with chalk, and builders use it to make a nice straight line. And what I did here was I replaced the chalk with uh, ink, and I extended all of the sight lines, most of the sight lines, um, in the work from the architecture. And what it did was that it created some shapes, and then it also, I also used the piece itself to play with the shadows of the piece. And the purple vector, the vector lines off of the pieces of architecture created the purple um, spotlight shape, which in my mind was a nice homage to Ed Ruscha's spotlight paintings. Um, so we're trying to keep this kind of short and light and moving, so I'm happy to take <laughs> questions at this point. Does, any, does anyone have any questions for Kim? Kim, I was interested in um, your colors. I, uh, I'm wondering, you know, how you chose those colors, and are, are they just colors you like, or? No, um, because of the location of the Sky Room, the, 
I chose them quite specifically. I wanted the green to have the organic back into the inorganic. So there's the very stiff architectural space and then applying green made it, softened it in an in a organic kind of way. Um, and then the, the dark purple, um, that just was purely aesthetic. I mean, it was just going through color chips and just figuring out which one's going to be kind of annoying and, and still riff off of the blue sky. Because on, on a good day, it, it is a blue sky and I wanted the colors to riff off of it. And the other thing was with the snap line, with, when I replaced it with the ink, I also had the choice of replacing the color. But I wanted to stick with the traditional snap line blue to reinforce that reference. Anyone else? Where do you see uh, your work in terms of relation to architecture and artwork? Like, what is it trying to do for the viewer? Uh, um, I didn't always do drawings about architecture. I actually got hooked when I did this show, a Biennale in Poland. And um, I called my selector and I said, OK, I've never been to Poland and I've never been in a Biennale, so tell me everything I need to know. And he basically said, you know, you just got to do the work on site because the work never gets shipped back and it's always a mess. There's usually one ladder, so just figure it out how to do it on site. <laughs> and I then, OK, great, fine. I have to do it on site. And I wrote the organizers and I said, just send me pictures of things you find interesting. And I wasn't any more specific. And it was all architecture. And I realized that this sort of Soviet brutalist architecture and the California modernist architecture we're having a very, a very sincere conversation and coming from different ideologies, but coming up with similar solutions, just one was vertical and the other was horizontal. And that really got me going intellectually. I really just started enjoying doing this research into these uh, forgotten or hidden or overlooked pieces of architecture. Thank you. Anyone else? Excellent. Well, thank you, Kim. Thank you. And we can all Hi, uh, my name is Owen. Um, this is my work. Uh, I'm not very good at talking at people, so I was hoping to turn this into more of a, a question and answer session. Um, but I'll start it off, and I'll ask the first question. Um, so uh, what are these? These are uh, what I call uh, durational photographs. And um, what they are is uh, they're video, recorded video that's being uh, processed on a computer, just layered on a computer, and then output and placed on screens that you'd find, uh, screens that are similar to screens that you'd find at an airport or a mall. Um, and so they're, they're essentially moving photographs. Um, so I, I think I've chosen photography because um, I apprenticed as a photographer. Um, and I wanted to think about photography and the boundaries uh, of that medium. And uh, I thought that it would be interesting to try to pull out the one element that makes photographs photographs well, the one key element, which is the, the static nature. So in order to do that, I have to uh, create what looks like a photograph. So there's a static camera. Um, there's not a lot of movement. I use subject matter that's uh, uh, traditionally used in photography or photo history. Um, and, then I, and then I record that. And. Uh, I, it, it turns into a control experiment. And the, the, what I'm hoping to do is sort of define the boundaries of what photography was or could be. Uh, and at the same time, hopefully, uh, hint at uh, elements of perhaps a new medium or a, a medium that's yet to come. 
So I'll start talking about this piece here. This is called uh, Retail Composition, and it's, it's an amalgam of objects that I've found near my studio in, in retail environments in, near my studio. So I bring back objects and I film them in, uh, in real time in the studio, and then I sort of layer them, not, not unlike you do in Photoshop, uh, but just on video, and uh, create this sort of stack of images. And then its output is one picture. So uh, this is, I've been doing this for a little while. This is, this is my first attempt to make uh, one of my durational pieces without a set time length. So I've, I've taken all of the objects and, they, and given them their own time signature or time span. So for example, the wrapping paper that's turning is about 12 seconds. This is two minutes. Um, this is three minutes. They all have different segments. So the, the, the intention is to try to create something that both has time and doesn't have time, but still remains a picture. So feel free to just ask me any questions as, as I'm going here. I don't want to like dominate. Uh, I can talk about this, this piece here. This is a uh, called two-way polyester flowers. And uh, <laughs> it's just a, it's a pot of flowers in a backyard near my studio. Um, quite beautiful and awful at the same time. Um, but uh, basically, I, I cut the file almost <laughs> in half. And then I flipped the file on top of itself, so it created a more a kind of a cubist uh, image. And then I took each side and I ran them in reverse time against each other. So the file kind of implodes on itself um, aesthetically and also in, in, in time. So it's kind of jumping, is that Yeah, that's the two files uh, uh, butting against each other, kind of rupturing. Uh, and I, I did leave a little, there's a little tripod, I kicked the tripod and I, I had it, I cut it out of the original but then I figured, um, I, I saw it again with the tripod kick when, it, when the two files were reversed and it kind of created a bit more of a kinetic break. No, no, it was an accident. <laughs> but I, but it, in editing, I ended up just adding it back in because it kind of worked with the flip. Well, I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, what type of photography were you doing before you invented durational photography? Yeah, well, I, yeah, I, I actually never made photography. I started off making, I went through film school, and uh, my, I made documentary films, and they were all just static shots like this. So uh, it was okay in film school, but it was better uh, in this sort of environment. So I sort of followed that path. Um, but I, I did also make um, kind of like street photographs that were in time like this, so portraits and things that I sort of found or encountered as well. These, these are generally either in the studio or just outside the studio. I, I, I sort of consider them all studio pictures, even though um, this one is shot on a wall of a post office on Pico. Um, I still consider it kind of a studio composition because I'm, I'm taking that same set of problems and applying it to something that's on the street. It's called Red Wall Three Parts, and it's, uh, it's three sections of three and a half minutes each, and there's just different arrangements of detritus that I found close by on, on the street. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I've shot the red. Sorry. Right. Yeah. I. I. Well, it is. It is. I, I use the red wall as a base, and then I film different pieces attached to it, and then I cut them back in. So it sort of creates a collage effect. Yeah. It's not. It's really. It's super simple. Back to the flowers. Yeah. 
That's just two. Two. It's actually the same image flipped on itself. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I should actually just say, I don't do, you bring up sort of a good point, I don't do a lot of animation. I, actually, I don't do any animation, which means I don't digitally affect or change my images so that they move. So everything is shot uh, in, in reality, in real time, and real space. So. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, especially with the one in the middle, I feel like it's kind of approaching the mindset of, of painting. Even though I'm not a painter, I kind of feel like maybe that's what a painter would have to decide. So um, uh, I think it's, it's just, it's probably just a feeling um, based on my experience and the, the, the pictures that I've made in the past. Uh, yeah, not a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you come up, you can see that there's a lot of reflections in the balloons. Um, you can see the studio actually in the balloons, and they, you just see me moving around. Um, but again, it's you know, it, it's hard. I, I don't want these to be too kinetic. I don't want it to be cinematic or lots of stuff happening. It has to be really still to have its effect. Um, I. So, did you say in the beginning that you were interested in the limitations of photography as a medium? Yeah, I think so, yeah. So, I would, what, like, what do you see as the limitations? But then also I would sort of add a second part of what do you see as the limitations of, like, time-based media? Well, it's exactly that. It's the limitations of photography are time, you know, and photography essentially stops time. And I'm, I've, I've always loved the idea of trying to create the conditions of, of a photograph without that. And I, I don't know if it's, if it's possible, but I think in trying to do it, potentially some, something happens. And it either tells me something about photography or something about the new technology, new medium that's coming. Do you so know that, what that is? I, I, I don't. I, don't. I, I, I try not to think conceptually. I think those things come through my attempt to make pictures. So that's, the, I start there. I start with trying to make something that looks interesting and perhaps beautiful or, or, or good. <laughs> and, uh, and then everything else kind of falls into place or, or doesn't. Um, Do you make paintings also? Uh, I don't, yeah. Don't yeah, no, I don't, I don't make paintings. Um, but I think a lot about painting. In, in making these, like you talked about, like it's a learning process or an exploratory process. Have there been like fruits or aha moments or anything that's like really tangible to you that that's come out of this so far? About photography or just about this kind of? About photo, yeah. Like in terms of exploring the boundaries you talked about and looking for the limitations of one or few. Yeah. Yeah. I'll probably maybe I'll talk more to the things I've discovered about the technology. That's great. Um, so I've, I've sort of figured out over the years that I've been doing this that certain surfaces and objects work better than others on this medium. So for example, things that reflect uh, or are flat, things like the balloons, tend to create a confusion between the surface of the, of the monitor and the surface of the balloon, which I think is important to try to make that confusion, because then it forces the viewer to decide that it's different. So you're, you're forced to say, well, that balloon is not on the screen, or it's not part of the screen. And then, it, and then that's sort of a, an, a, an important part of making a picture, I think, is making that distinction, if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. there's like, there's some space between the surface and the... Right, concept. exactly, yeah. And then, and then also uh, atmosphere. I've, I've really started paying attention to atmosphere when I, I, you know, I didn't when I started, so uh, sort of like romantic things like the wind and stuff. I, you know, it's really become part of my work. Thank you. Um, so I'm, in, that, in that way, it's also like things that painters maybe used to think about like a long time ago, 500 years ago or something. They would put wind effects into their paintings. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Owen. Yep. 
Anyone else? Hi. Hey. It's not really a question, but I think you're pretty awesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Chris, when we came to the studio, we had a really good conversation about, about exactly that. And um, I think he sort of incurred, he, he selected pieces that would sort of approach um, that w would be closer to painting, I think, because it would fit well in this show. So um, I do have other works that are a bit more photographic as well. But um, You mentioned that the screens are like screens that you'd see in, the mo in a mall. Was there a deliberate decision of the type of monitor or screen that you wanted to show them on? Yeah, I, I, I do like that there's a bit of a confusion between that mall object and, and this, even though it's presented in a gallery space. I think it's that, that technology, that, that idea that, it's, that it is something technological that, that requires power and um, that you might see in everyday life is good because it kind of, it reminds us that there is, uh, you know, there's all this stuff going on in order to make the picture. It's not, not hidden away. Um, so in that sense, I wouldn't put like wood frames on or, or like sink the cable through the wall. Try to try to hide it. Hi. Hey. I, th I think as a photographer, because there's always, there's always a, a machine between you and what you're doing, there's always the question that's, all, that's been a part of photo history. So I think photographers have always thought about those things, or I hope so. Um, yeah. Unless there's someone else who has a question, I think that's a great place to end it. That's, that's great. Thank you, Lauren. Thank, thank you. I think I'll also just do a quick introduction to the two pieces and then um, open it up for questions. That usually works best. So um, the painting we're standing in front of, um, I had started making around the time that the uh, January 25th revolution happened in Egypt. And um, so I had to kind of stop in the middle of working and gloom myself to Al Jazeera and figure out what was happening. I was born and raised in Cairo, and, and, um, but I haven't lived there for, I think I'm kind of scared to count the years now, but maybe 15, 20 years. Um, and so it was one of those things, one of those moments where um, every, everything, you know, the moments in the studio where you kind of have to stop and consider the world around you a little bit more before you can move on. And so um, the very first few days uh, of the revolution, uh, the only uh, imagery coming out of Tahrir was this kind of helicopter shot of the square. Um, there, it was rumored that the government wasn't allowing any journalists to go into the square to photograph the people so that it didn't look as... Um, extensive, uh, and you couldn't really see who was at the square, and they can just say, oh, these are just um, thugs and uh, fringe p part of the population that was starting these protests. So I had to sort out a way for me to deal with this epic historical event that was unfolding um, from this kind of distance, both you know, geographically and also um, my distance from that part of uh, my culture and 
my background and kind of reconsider my relationship with um, that, that part of me. So I thought that the, the best way for me to address that, being a painter and a sculptor and really a formalist as, at heart, is to figure out a way to use abstraction um, to ask all those questions that I had about the work. Um, so I had to figure out a, a language that combined um, all, of, all of the imagery that was coming out of Tahrir, all of the imagery, this kind of romantic imagery that I had walking through the streets in Cairo, this beautiful carved um, screens, the piracy screens, um, covering a lot of the architecture in, in the old part of Cairo. Um, and also being in my studio in Highland Park and um, in California and in LA and on the West Coast and all of this uh, history of painting that I was completely involved in. And I, you know, I think it was at that moment where I realized that that's where my interest was going to be for a very long time, which is taking abstraction and politics and culture and social issues and putting all of those things um, in a place that maybe you wouldn't expect. And I found that what i most interested in, in both the sculpture and the painting, and my practice in general, is to put things that are um, a little bit contradictory or in opposition um, and find a condition where these things can exist and talk to each other. Um, so all of the patterning in this painting come from traditional Arabic patterning. A lot of them are based um, on, this specific one is based on uh, privacy screens that were used in the harem. So this separation between public and private space, and then the kind of, um, the takeover of the public space as a place for protest. Um, so I was interested in that, in margin between public and private, um, between something that was feminine and masculine, between something that was violent and beautiful. And so I find that that's where my interest tends to be. Um, and for me, these patterns were, were you know, um, I couldn't dismiss them as just ornamental or decorative or beautiful, but they became really politically charged. Um, whether I was coming at it from a, a kind of a feminist perspective or whether I was coming at it from a cultural and political perspective. So, I was trying to figure out how to do that all and still make the paintings that I wanted to make. <laughs> um, so that gives you some idea about what the painting's about. Um, should we scoot over a little bit so you guys can see the sculpture? Um, so when Chris invited me to be in the exhibition, he um, asked me if I'd be interested in doing a, a special piece for the Skyrim. Um, and I have to tell you, this is one of the more daunting spaces I've had to make work for. Um, but I was also had been working for three years on a series of sculptures based on um, a, a very famous uh, trilogy of novels by a uh, Nobel winning um, writer from Egypt called Nagib Mahfouz. And it was uh, a series of novels that it, it, that kind of marked the change and the evolution of the er, Egyptian and Arabic identity, post, like post-colonial identity, and the rise um, of the female characters kind of very subtly rise in the background, as was the women's movement in Cairo at the time, and it, over, all over Egypt at the time. So I kind of took, um, I titled all three, all three works after each of the novels, and when Chris invited me to do this, I figured the best thing to do was to complete that work. I had done the first two sculptures at other venues. Um, and the final novel uh, was really where everything comes apart. Uh, the patriarchal hero of the book um, is uh, kind of exposed. Um, the female characters in the book rise. Um, and of course, Egypt kind of takes the next step um, into its own. And I was taking, again, uh, like I was saying, images of, uh, or kind of imagined images from the book of the female characters passing through or, or moving out of the house, out of, from behind the mashrabiyas and into the streets, and this kind of, his description of the women walking and moving into the streets, and uh, the, the jewelry that they were wearing, the, the clothes that they were wearing, um, 
And so a lot of the sculpture was based on these kind of teardrop Bedouin earrings that were very traditional um, at the time. And, and this, of all the three pieces, the most deconstructed and something new is coming. Um, something new is, is evolving out of the shape. The reason, and I, you know, of course, because I'm, I'm looking at all of this through a lens, um, is diasporic a word, Renee? <laughs> through a diasporic <laughs> lens, it, it didn't make sense for me to just make a big, beautiful earring, which I'd love to make, um, but that I had to also consider the fact that I'm looking at this from, again, a historical difference, a distance and a cultural distance, and uh, I had to still be true to my practice and my interest in formalism, and um, my, I, you know, I'm not going to say the I word, I'm sorry, my identity <laughs> um, as uh, an Egyptian and as an American and as an Angelino, as a, uh, you know. So, so my, my heart was still into, into this kind of high modern um, furniture making practice that, that was really considered, again, uh, very apolitical apolitical, very formalist, and didn't, didn't hold any, um, you know, it's supposed to be kind of the negative that you bring all of your information to. Um, and so the process of building this was very much like a furniture making process. So there is no, uh, if you've seen a mashrabeya, you know that this is much more decorative and the, all the pieces, the way they're put together are in kind of extreme detail. And here I've kind of um, made it much more minimal you know, in a, so that there's more of a conversation between a Western minimal sculptural language and an Eastern um, ornamental decorative language. And hopefully by putting those two things together, some questions arise about what, why you would do that and how you would do that and what, what that means, so. No, I actually have a whole team of people that help me do it. <laughs> I design everything and I make everything in paper. And, and then I have a team of people that helps me build all the sculptures because it really is a furniture making craft. It's extremely high end uh, fabrication that I would not be able to do in my studio. <laughs> Um, there, there isn't a direct, no, symbol, but I did, I did want it to kind of, um, look star-like, um, and I, I don't know if you notice also the painting has kind of a, a nebulous shape. Yeah, if you look at um, different parts of the painting, you'll see that the, the pattern, as I, as I cut it, um, starts to break down um, and starts to interfere with the painting, or actually the painting starts to take over the pattern in a lot of places. So a lot of times when I'm making those formal decisions, I'm using the content and the subject matter of the work to make those decisions. So instead of just cutting out a really beautiful pattern, um, I'm trying to kind of bring forward some um, resistance between um, the organic nature of the paint, the way that I lay the paint down, and the kind of more rigid um, nature of the pattern and allowing there to be a space where, again, you question how and why these things um, exist in the same space and, and what's, you know, w which of those things come forward and become a position of power and which don't. Any other questions? I'm going to look at you in case you have questions. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Yes. Kate, um, it takes. It, it takes. Yeah, I think we calculated it once. I also have an, my amazing assistant is is here, and um, it, it takes. It was three, four of us, a few months to do. Yeah, it's, it's very labor intensive. It's a very basic process, you know, it's just a number 11 X-Acto knife. It's, so you're kind of going through and drawing, but with a knife instead of a pencil. 
Um, but it's, it takes time. Yeah, it's a few months. I think maybe that why that that's why that whole series was formally kind of like circular um, and like a vessel and something that's moving and changing. Um, one of the things I was trying to be very careful about when I was making this painting was not to not come to any conclusions about what was, what, you know, any kind of political conclusions about what was happening, but really just for me to figure out a way to process what was happening and my relationship with that. So it is definitely interesting for me to look back at it now. Um, I, I still think that it, it, um, it's relevant, you know, and I, the work I'm making right now, which I'm making work that's going to be in a show in Dubai in October, I'm kind of sorting out how I'm dealing with kind of the current political situation and figuring out how that factors into what I'm making. What, sorry. I have, if I knew any of that, I would be uh, the president right now, so I couldn't tell you. Um, any other hard questions? I think the the most. That's a really good question. I'm going to repeat it. Um, she was asking me if, if I felt a responsibility or that I felt like I'm now an educator about what was happening in Egypt, and I, I couldn't. I don't think I'm qualified. Uh, what The most I can hope for from the work is to start a conversation, and really, and it's, it's a conversation I'm having. I'm having it with my dad. He's back here. Um, I'm having it with my friends. I'm having it with family, you know, and I think at this point, more and more artists in L.A. now more than ever is a place where global conversations are happening and awareness of the rest of the world is finally coming <laughs> forward. And so all I could really hope for is for somebody to look at the work and, um, and, then, and then kind of educate themselves, you know, and then go find, you know, ask a question, you know, ask me, you know, we'll go to coffee and we can talk about it, you know, or at, you can go on, um, on the internet and, and do some research. So it's, it's really just... Um, a, a place to begin, and it was a place to begin for me to sort out how I felt about what was happening, and it was also, I hope, a, be, a place to begin for somebody who's experiencing the work as well. Well, thank you so much, Shireen, and thanks to everyone for coming out tonight. A big thanks to Owen and to Kim as well. And uh, please take a look at the show, uh, take your time, and there's drinks downstairs. Thanks so much. <laughs>